Okay, so so the thing that I want to share with you today is this one. So here's a project that we have been developing here in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And this is a, a project that helps you to understand some of the very complicated concepts in a, well, in the future. And this is, a, you know, this tells a little bit about, you know, what are the courses offered through this website. I know you guys are involved, but this is a great work. This is a really, really awesome work. And then, uh, you know, how it works and how, you know, a little bit of background. And these are the courses that will be available soon. You know, Mazing Dynamics, which I'm sure you recognize that already. So that's UCIS course. And then uh, Finite Elements, Mechanics, and uh, Mechatronic Simulation. So all these courses will be available in future through this uh, website. And how it goes is that you can enroll and then it uh, allows you to watch some videos. And after videos, there are quizzes or questions. And once you pass the questions, it takes you to another level. So it's from zero level, takes you to the first level and so on and so forth. And once you do all these levels, then you are done with the course and it will be created automatically. So how is a course content? You know, this is how it looks. Here, just a few examples. In this video, we will take a look at the most common coordinate systems used in the course. We will focus on the Cartesian and polar coordinate systems. We will explain how to define the positive and negative directions of such systems and talk about some of their characteristics. At the end of the video, we expect you to recognize these systems and know what the minimum requirements are to create these systems. You will not regret this one. Let's start with the one most familiar to us, the Cartesian coordinate system. But better, let's take a step back and define what are the minimum components any coordinate system needs to have. Okay. This is no, kind I'm of arbitrary, but it works. Okay. So no there are three problems. elements that are... But this is how it will look like. So they are like, you know, something that helps you to get the concept about the coordinates, so on and so forth. Hold on, so now we're back. So. Um, my plan is this. So I'm planning to email the link. Well, now there's a limited amount of material available, but um, sometimes later during this course, we'll send you a link so you can take a look and let us know in your perspective how it feels and if there's something that this could be beneficial to I mean, that's not going to be beneficial to you, but if there's any improvement proposals that you would like to make. Okay, so that's... Uh, for your information. And now, another thing here. Oh yeah, by the way, is it clear how is a guided tutorials and how is a simulation work? Because there is a um, information that was uh, incorrect that I produced in my first lecture regarding these midterm reports. Uh, did you participate in tutor tutorial on Friday? and better to explain what exactly is needed and when are the deadlines. So is it clear for all of you? Good, good, because the deadlines are not as, as strict that, that I explained them to be. So is it so that there's no deadline this week? So no deadline this week. Okay, so no deadline this week, but the first deadline will be on next week, next week. Okay, and basically what we would like to see in next week is that you are getting started. So you, there's just a little bit of effort to do things that are needed in, a, in this simulation assignment. Okay, so not expecting you to solve all the problems, but getting started. And the next one, so a little bit of progress, top of the previous one and so on and so forth. So that's the idea. Okay, so it's clear, pretty clear. Okay, now hopefully, the streaming is good. Is, uh, can you can you please check it out? How the streaming is, streaming is? Is it all right? So is it is it looking uh, clear enough? Also, the another thing that I need to do is that I need to reorganize our model site sometime soon, and also I need to reorganize uh, the YouTube channel to make sure that it is you know easy to read and it is easy to see those uh, lecture recordings. We'll do that. Uh, Hopefully sometimes later this week. If not, then it's going to be next week. Also, I got your feedback 
from simulation of a mechatronic machine. So thank you very much. I, I'm not sure what was the percentage of the student that actually submitted the feedback, but I got the feeling that it was uh, quite high. I'm estimating like 70% of all the participants submitted their feedback. And, uh, and uh, I don't know if you noticed my feedback to your feedback. My, yes, so did you notice it? I emailed that uh, yesterday. And I said that, yeah, there are, you know, overall satisfaction was, was good. And uh, the things that we need to look at in the future is the exam. Exam is, as it is at the moment, I'm not completely pleased about that because it's very black and white. And this is what we discussed earlier. So we need to figure out the way to make it more flexible, such that if you enter your answer incorrectly, it allows you to revise it. Maybe providing your hint and then redo it. Of course, the points will go down, but now it's way too black and white. Like an example is this Jacobian matrix. If you do it correctly, six points. If it is incorrectly, minor mistakes, it's zero points. And it should not be that black and white. So we're looking at the ways to improve that. And then uh, there is a, a little bit something about in-class quizzes, you know, particularly those uh, online participants, they were not happy about the in-class quizzes as they were not able to answer those quizzes because they were only available in a live streaming. We'll take a look like if there is a possibility to offer um, online participants to do in class quizzes a bit later or some alternative ways. And what else? Uh, a little bit about the theoretical aspects. It is true that the course was super, super theoretical. And uh, really the, the case is where you can apply all these to practical problems will be explained in this course. Once we all done with the flexible description of flexible bodies, then we're looking at the different perspectives and different applications, vehicles, many, many others. And then you can learn what exactly is the role of simulation in case of pra solving practical problems. Okay, was there something else too? I don't remember anymore. At least those three items was mentioned as uh, something that needs a little bit of attention in the future. Anything else? Anything that you would like to give me some other feedback, like right now? So can you make this to be a bit better? Because really what I would like to do with this course is that I would like to make that as a you know, very high quality course, something that people can enjoy to participate. So we don't discuss today. No communication today. Is it like, yes, no communication. Okay, fine. Fine. You sure that you have no improvements, improvement proposals in your mind? Not this time. Okay, I understand. Uh, with that, let's close the case of three dimensional multibody dynamics. I have just a few slides to co cl co close the case. And then I would really like to move on to introduction of flexible multibody dynamics. And this is going to be something that takes all the lectures from this to midterm exam. So I'm looking, like I explained to you earlier, I wanted to explain that how I understand the finite settlement method, because it's one of the most often used concepts in mechanical engineering. I mean, the structural analysis is mostly carried out by using a finite settlement method. Also, I would like to explain what is the finite settlement method in a mathematical point of view. I'm not going to go very deep in the theory, but I will explain how it is that the element understands its soul, or what's the soul of the finite settlement method, how is ingredients that makes finite settlement method to happen. That I would like to explain you. Hopefully, you find it useful. And then, and then we're going to look at the ways how one can carry out an eigenvalue analysis based on finite settlement method. So it's one of the analyses you can carry out. How to interpret the results and how to use that as a part of the model reduction technique. That will be pretty much in a nutshell what happens in this period. Okay, now 
This is something that I explained already in the first lecture. So how is a rotary quest equation? But because everything that are based or using for parameters are based on rotary quest equation, I'm uh, reminding you that procedure one more time. So again, rotary quest equation is something that takes a place when you have an original vector and then you attach a unit link vector to origin of your original vector and then you're deducing the amount of rotation that is theta. And then what is an objective here is to find the relation between the original vector and its final configuration. And that you can make it happen with partial mathematical manipulation. And once you do that, then the relation can be expressed by 4 by 4 matrix that is written here. So let me see how is my drawing today. Okay. Well, it seems that this guy is not cooperating. So this is how it is. And now we have the vector u bar, excuse me, the vector v, which is unique in the length. It's just the skew symmetric form that is expressed. And then we have here angle theta, this one here. And then we have here the vector v again, and angle theta. So this is the one that is based on four parameters. Now, this can be modified by calling some of the components by the particular names. And this will introduce us another method, which is Euler parameters. And Euler parameters is based on Rotterdam's equation. So we're just calling components according to this name list. And once we substitute in the name list to this original equation, this one here, this is how the 3 by 3 rotation matrix reads. Now, in case of or when we look at the written exam, I could ask, like, how is a, what's the difference between Euler angles and Euler parameters? So, okay, or are you able to answer that question already now? Well, the way to answer that question is to say, well, Euler angles are based on three parameters. So it's based on three successive rotations. Its usability is high. So it's easy to understand what these three parameters are standing for. But it suffers from numerical singularity. And that's called gimbal lock. Okay? Euler parameters is based on four parameters. So it's, it's conceptually very different. So it's not an extension, it's just a completely different story, even though that the not name implies that they're somehow cousins or brothers or something. They are not. So that's just a completely different story. So these four parameters are not independent. But they are coupled because of constraint. The constraint is related to this unique length vector v. So it's a, it must be unit in length. And that introduced the constraint equation. The usability of Euler parameters is very low because you might have a hard time to understand how these four parameters are associated with body orientation. It's not suffering from singularity. And those are the major differences. Clear? So, can we already vote this time that this is a question that will be in written exam? So it's like, yes. So is, it, is that a done deal? Or you want to see the full list first? Because I can show the full list and then you can pick the one. But this could be something that, you know, with that explanation that I just provided and it is recorded, maximum points. Okay? Clear? Okay, so let's get back to that a little later. Then last week we discussed about an extension of multi-body dynamics and what we discussed as an extension was a robot kinematics and we learned the method that is called 4x4 four four transformation matrix method and this 4x4 four four transformation matrix origin from the multi-body dynamics or however you wanted to put it ingredients components needed to do this are exactly the components you use in a multi-body system dynamics you know, in a multi-body system dynamics, for well, some reason this pen is not very good today. 
you have these kinematics where you're first expressing the translation of body reference coordinate system with respect to global coordinate system. That's the component that you look relocated here in the upper right corner of a 4x4 transformation matrix. No thinking. And then the transformation matrix, which is here 4x4 matrix, you will relocate it and put it in the upper left corner of the 4x4 transformation matrix. What is left is just the final row. The final row will be filled by zeros except the diagonal component which has to be equal to zero. It's called scaling factor. But we don't want to scale anything here, so that's why it is need to be zero. Now, with the U bar, in turn, will be reconstructed such the way that we will express the local description with help of vector P. And the vector P and the vector U bar are related as shown here. So you will take a vector U bar and its component, put it as the first three components of the vector P, and the last remaining component again will be equal to one. Okay. That's how it goes. So what's the benefit? Well, the benefit is that you can simultaneously account the translation and rotation. It helps you to provide the kinematics of a robotic with fairly straightforward manner. So you can move from here from coordinate system U to coordinate system B by simply one 4x4 transformation matrix. And now, if you want to continue from that, if you want to move from B to C, it's another 4x4 transformation matrix. So this is how you can move from one coordinate system to another to figure out where the end effector of a robotic is located at. So the most common way to use this is Denovit Hartenberg. And Denovit Hartenberg is based on four parameters. And the usage is quite straightforward. You produce a matrix, or maybe better to say a table. And table will be such that there is a body and these three parameters that are associated each one of the bodies. So once you have the table ready, then it is a matter of substitution to create the kinematics. So it's fairly straightforward procedure. Of course, what is difficult is to create that table in the first place. So it goes like this. Here is, you know, I, I need to apologize. This says in Finnish, but this is supposed to be, a, obviously this is supposed to be a body, body ID. And the body ID is a one, two, look at that, it. there's another typing mistake. This should be two, of course. And then mm, three. So these are the bodies. And I would like to create the kinematics for this kind of symbol robotics. For the first body is attached to crown, such the way that it is rotate along its own axis. Then there is a revolute joint that connects the first and second body, and a revolute joint that connects the second and third body. Now, to create the kinematics, you need to create this table here. So each one of the rows in the table correspond the bodies, and each one of the columns correspond these four parameters that you need in the Denavite Hartenberg method. Once this is ready, then you're creating 4x4 four four transformation matrix associated to each one of these three bodies. You multiply them together. That's your kinematics. You got the concept. Okay. In written exam. Hmm. Is it too much to ask to make your, this kind of table for a random robotics? So it's yes and no. So someone is saying no and somebody is saying yes. So yes and no. Something that you are familiar with in, in previous examples. Can we do that? That we can do. Okay, let's, let's do Yes, sir. So what does that again? What are these four parameters? These parameters, this one. 
Okay, let me see if I can, can I remove this? I guess that this is the only way to remove it. No. Here. So your question was, what are these four parameters? Okay, these four parameters are the one that we looked at the last week. So that each one of them are related to, you know, this body representation. So this alpha here says how is a twist. That there was a, there is also a written explanation about each one of these parameters. How much that twist? What's the length? Is the second one, and then uh, how is uh, this distance here d? And how I need to put that. How is it this distance d? How much they are separated this this direction? And what's the angle theta? Those are the four parameters. And it really is not realistic to ask you to understand this, you know, that simply because it needs a little bit of practice to understand them in details and to be used, to be able to use them in practical problems. But, you know, just an example. Let me take this away again. Okay. So the first body. The first body is this body here and it can rotate around this Z axis. So the uh, uh, let me see how it goes. Ah, uh, here. So it is assumed that this direction. Oh, this is actually very complicated to explain. So it is assumed that this first coordinate system is here, and then it is twisted around the alpha, and the length is L. And then D is length. D is the length, and the D is the, this component here. Now oh, this needs. I understand that this needs a little bit of practice to be able to use it. Okay, but that's not the intention of this course to be able to use this in back and forth. So, can we keep this in the level of do you understand the principle? Do you understand the principle? So there's four parameters, and those four parameters are substituted the four by four transformation matrix. And then you, once you multiply these transformation matrices together, you get the kinematics. Okay, so I'm not obviously unable to ask you to fill up this table. It, that would be unrealistic. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. So let's move on. So let's close the 3D kinematics. So we started this last week, and now I would like to close it. So here's how is the velocity of the particle. So once we have the precision equation, and once we differentiate that with respect to time, we will get the velocity. Velocity is definite in a planar case. And this actually gives you the whole idea why the spatial kinematics is so much difficult than the planar kinematics. So let's look at that, and if you understand that, that's where we're going to stop. So, now, I will highlight the really the most important things, and then I will ask if you understand this or not. Of course, not asking if you understand, because you always say, yes, I do understand. Oh, it's clear. Not that way, but I would like to use in-class quizzes to ask if you understand it. Okay? Now, full attention to me now. Okay? Let's go there. Now, here is uh, expression of velocity. Obviously, the component in the middle here will be equal to zero. And that's because we are, yes, dealing with the rigid bodies. So we are dealing with the rigid bodies, and if we're dealing with the rigid bodies, vector u bar will be constant with respect to time. Clear. What is left is a uh, Translation of velocity that consists of three components. Those are the velocity along the global x, y, and z coordinate axis. And then I have here time derivative of rotation matrix. Now here is a big difference between the planar and spatial cases. Remember, in a spatial, excuse me, in a planar case, you were able to express this that's the way that it was. Uh, is it is clear? Oh my God, this is a little hard to write it like, 
But can you can you understand what I'm talking about right there? No, no, you don't understand. Okay, let me do it a bit better. Okay, here. This was a rotation matrix that was differentiated with respect to angle theta, multiplied by time derivative of uh, of generalized coordinates. I understand it's really, really hard to understand. But remember this story? A little bit. Okay. How is this in a spatial case? You know, a spatial case, it's seemingly same. Seemingly. But only seemingly. Because, you know, it, time derivative of a rotation matrix can be expressed in such a way that it is origin of the rotation matrix multiplied by angular velocity vector is a vector except that this is a skew symmetric representation but still is a vector because angular velocity consists of three components three components here is already when you see that things are not going well how you can see that well you can see that if you're using L parameters to express your rotations how many parameters you have four now, if you differentiate your elder parameters with respect to time, how many parameters you will have? Four. How many angular velocities you have? Three. Because the body can rotate in a three different ways. No. So they don't, they don't match. They don't match. There is no way to make three to be four or, you know, other way around. You cannot make it happen. What that means for us? Well, it means for us that, you know, this one here, this angle of velocity is not the same that the time derivatives of, of rotational generalized coordinates or time derivative of rotational generalized coordinates. This one here, they don't get along. They simply don't get along. We can make them to get along, but it needs a little bit of extra help. Okay, so that's the bottom line, the story that I wanted to tell you. So how is that we can make this to, to get along? Well, this is repeating what I've just said to you, that the angular velocity and time derivative of these rotational parameters are not safe. You cannot make them safe, regardless how you select your generalized coordinates. Even if you select them as a Euler angles, Euler parameters, regardless of the sequence of Euler angles, they're not safe. You cannot make them to be safe. And that's a big difference. The only, or the kind of the person that comes and rescues us, to helps to create the relation between the angle of velocity and time there with the rotational parameters, is a person called G. G matrix. T, you know, is like, a, you know, is it so it, uh, it's like a special agent? G-Man? Have you ever heard that? Special agent. You haven't heard it? Special agent called G-Man. Is it so? You haven't heard the story. Anyways, it's a superman that is called G. G-Man. Let's make it a bit better. Let's call it a G-Woman. Okay? T woman comes in a play and introduces the relationship between the angle of velocity and time derivatives of rotational parameters. Sounds like a similarly simple story, but mathematic and mathematically it is. That's what it is. This is relation. So angle of velocity can be now related to time derivatives of generalized coordinates. And all that be carried out with help of T matrix. The problem we're facing because of the T. T is coming to rescue us, but not for free. It is asking the price to do it. The price is quite high because everything from this on will be based on T. Everything you do, the T will be part of the game. So you cannot get rid of the T anymore. So it comes and rescue, but is never leaving from your life. So what it means? Well, first of all, let's take a look. How is this T? And now, the first important observation regarding the T is that it is, of course, depending on what is your selection of rotational parameters. 
The, introduce, what I'm, the way that I'm introducing the G matrix here is based on L angles. But of course, if you're using L parameters, then the G matrix will have a completely different form, even the different dimensions, because we are dealing with the four parameters. But in the case of L angles, how it is. This how you can write the G matrix in case of L angles. And actually, when you look at this, it is not so bad. Why it is not so bad? Because actually this is something that you are kind of familiar with already. How come? Well, let me explain. But if you look at the columns of G matrix, the columns are something that you are actually very much familiar with. What axis is the first column? Z axis, all right? So it's a Z axis. Now, assuming that the first rotation, this C, what the heck is the name of this? C. Anyway, so assuming that that's equal to C, what is the second axis? What's this is going to be? If this is zero, this is going to be zero. It's going to be one, zero, zero. X axis, correct. Assuming that these two rotations are equal to zero, what is uh, my third column. It's going to be 0, 0, 1. 0, 0, 1. Check. This is exactly the sequence we used when we divide the other angles. Remember? Check, X, check. Now, if you decided to use another sequence, then you have to modify the G. How this is important, and why this is actually helping your life, it is helping your life because actually what you need to do is that you have to express everything in terms of generalized coordinates, including inertia. Now, are you able to tell me inertia parameters that are based on L parameters? Well, you're clever people, maybe you can do it, but myself, I cannot do it. It's so complicated, it's so going to be so difficult. So what you can do then is that you can use your local coordinate system to express the inertia tensor and then with the help of T-matrix to map that to any representation you want. So that's why it actually becomes very handy, very important. Okay. Here comes story in a short. Here comes the summer. So we end up to have a problem. And the problem but the name of the problem was that angular velocity is not the same than time derivatives of rotational parameters. You cannot make them same. So then comes the, you know, you know, someone that helps you to solve the problem, and someone that is help, able to help you to solve the problem is called G woman. G woman comes into play and introduces the relation between angular velocity and time derivatives of rotational parameters. Here it is. And from this on, G woman will never ever leave from your life. It will be always there, because it's always inherent part of the kinematics. But it's kind of nice, because it helps you to use local coordinate system to express the inertia tensor, and then with help of G matrix, you can map to any representation you want. Okay, what the G matrix is doing for you? Can you answer that question? It maps something, but what it map? Is this? Yeah. Can I ask that in the class quiz? Okay, that will I will do. Oh, hold on. Oh, no, 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 here. Matrix T, this T woman is important because it couples local and global coordinates. It couples angular velocity vector and derivatives of generalized coordinates. Describes the inertia properties of the body. Clo couples global and generalized coordinates, which is correct. Are you able to log in? Yeah. Good. Nice.
uh, okay, I'm not going to do it because if I close this, then they will see your identity. I mean, the whole world will see your student number and everything. And that's a criminal action from my side. So I cannot do it. But you know that correct answer? No pressure, of course, no pressure. So what is it? Can you, can you say it? You can keep that as your private information and save it later, all right? Okay, so let's take a look. Let's take a look. Is this easy question or a difficult question? Easy. Still, what? Still easy. Okay, so we'll see. So how is, uh, so roughly 10 students are thinking. Okay, let's look at the, okay, let's, hold on, hold on. Don't answer yet, don't answer yet. Okay, so what are, let's look at the choices here. So it couples the local and global coordinates. What are the local coordinates? Like the U bar. Global coordinates. I don't know about that. Okay, couples angular velocity vector. Okay, so it's already promising. Angular velocity and time derivatives of generalized coordinates. Hmm, okay, let's move on to next. Describe the inertia properties of the body. Well, how much we have discussed about the inertia so far? Very little. So very little. So I don't think that's a, that's the case. Couples the global and generalized coordinates. A little bit in that neighborhood. But let's see how his answer. Okay, is it going to be? Uh, is it going to be or is it not? You know, you know what, 100% of course. Uh, four students are thinking, now look, I'm very happy to see this. What I like to see is that, so we have 15 participants here in a lecture. Right, yeah, 15, exactly 15, 16 actually. But you know, they, we still have here 26 participants. So some of, some of you are following this using online apps. And it is fine, of course. It is fine. So you can do that. OK, can I, can I still three students? By the way, another comment that I got from you, particularly from online participants, they said that sometimes these in-class quizzes were not visible. Somehow they were disappearing. Don't know what, uh, first time that I hear something like that. Really don't know about that. Okay, two students, so can, can we go? Because I'm kind of like, you know, this is, first of all, this is very, very difficult question. So if scoring 100% in a question like that, that, that's, I don't know what to say if that's really gonna happen, but it's like, big deal. All right, so we are still having two students, so let me put this in a hold for a little while. And let me move here. All right. So now, from this on, in a kinematics, we have the T matrix. And now I'm not planning to explain you the whole story from here, from velocity to acceleration, and then all the joints and so on and so forth. This is going to be overly lengthy. We're going to just look at the highlights, and that's it. That's it. What I just explained about the T matrix. If you understand that, that's a lot. That's a huge amount of information. Huge amount of information about three-dimensional kinematics. Okay. And then here, this is how the acceleration look like. You know, I'm not that interested in how are the details of the acceleration. Let me try to put this a bit smaller, like this. So you know, we have translational acceleration, normal acceleration, and tangential acceleration. No surprises here. We have no, again, we have no Coriolis acceleration. And why is that? Again, because we are not dealing with the flexible bodies. That's why. Now, then, how is that I can express the velocity, excuse me, acceleration in terms of generalized coordinates? This is where the mass decay starts, actually. 
this is very messy and you don't need to worry about this because everything is automatically implemented for you but shortly you know I have here components that are linearly related to acceleration and then the ones that are quadratically related to velocities and these are quadratically related to velocities and this is going to be my quadratic velocity vector now using all that information my mass matrix I'm you know putting that to my expression of virtual works of inertia forces my mass matrix eventually and now I'm gonna turn a few slides eventually look like this this is gonna be my mass matrix and look how is my mass matrix this T is part of the K like in a quadratic velocity vector the T is part of the K so it is really critical part of the development of inertia forces but helpful component as well because it allows you to express your inertia tensor using the local coordinate system and then map to that to any representation you want okay that's it that's where I'm gonna close the case and now I would like to see how is my in-class quiz today here okay what do you say? Should we go? Should we just simply go? Okay, so in five, four, three, two, one. selfie here and put that in our remote side out. Can you do that? So can you do it? Okay, let's make the break and then after the break, then uh, let's take a selfie and then uh, then afterwards we'll look off. How we can organize ourselves? <laughs> like that? Okay, so let me, where should I call? I'm not very good with the selfie picture, but uh, let me try. Yeah. <laughs> 